was our responsibility for the reliability of the grid to make sure that when Americans hit the switch, the lights come on. My name is Mike Maselli, and this is The Energy Show with REI Energy, where we're energizing your investments and maximizing your tax deductions. Today, we're going to be talking about grid innovations, and you're going to discover how misguided public policy oftentimes puts the electric grid at risk and how innovative technology may strengthen the grid. My guest today is Neil Chatterjee. Neil is a former commissioner and chairman of the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission. Well, Neil, it's great to have you on the show today. Thank you for having me. Yeah, so this is a very interesting topic to me. You know, I've been reading a lot about some of the stuff that you've done, and I know you have a background in government, and you're also an attorney. Could you give our listeners a little bit of information about yourself? Oh, uh, yeah, absolutely. My name is Neil Chatterjee. Uh, uh, I've been uh, a longtime uh, fixture in the energy policy space. Uh, I was an aide in the U.S. Congress, and in the beginning of my career, worked in both the House of Representatives and then did uh, about a decade with my home state senator, uh, Senator Mitch McConnell of Kentucky. Uh, while he served as Republican leader in the Senate, I was his principal energy policy advisor. Uh, and from there, he was uh, uh, gracious enough to help me get appointed to serve a term as both commissioner and chairman of the United States Federal Energy Regulatory Commission, uh, which in my view is the principal energy regulatory body in the United States of America. And so during uh, my service, both in Congress and at the commission, I feel that uh, I've had a front row seat. I've been quite fortunate to see many of the critical energy policy issues of the day up close. And now in my post-government career, uh, uh, I'm in a position where I'm able to share some of my experiences and, uh, and expertise and uh, hopefully inform people about the significance of some of these really important issues. Well, thanks. Yeah. And that comes near and dear to my heart because obviously I live here in Texas and I went through the big freeze and, you know, we were five days without power. And of course, there, as you know, there's been a lot of talk going back and forth here in Texas. Are we going to see rolling blackouts? Is the grid been upgraded? So in Texas, we have an independent grid, right? And does the rest of the company, is, is it on the government's grid? How does that work? So uh, that's a great question. So we've got uh, and, and and the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission or FERC um, is the government body that has oversight of the competitive wholesale markets around the country, with the exception of Texas. As you mentioned, ERCOT, the uh, the market um, overseer, the, the regional transmission organization, if you will, uh, is not subject to FERC jurisdiction in Texas, although FERC does have uh, jurisdiction over reliability rules and the such, and FERC plays a role in evaluating applications for natural gas pipelines. Um, but, but, but generally, FERC does not oversee ERCOT and Texas, but there are several other regions of the country, uh, the New England states, New York, the Mid-Atlantic, um, you know, kind of the Midwest, Big Ten states, California. They are organized in these regional transmission organizations, these independent system operators, um, they're competitive wholesale power markets and FERC oversees those power markets. And then you have regions of the country like my home state of Kentucky and many parts of the Southeast, as well as some parts of the West that have traditional uh, state regulated, vertically integrated utilities. And so um, uh, there, there's sort of a couple of different flavors to the generation distribution and consumption of power in the U.S. Well, is it, in your opinion, is it better to have an independent uh, or is it better to be part of the whole big infrastructure, you know, like Texas being independent? <laughs> or <ERC? laughs> we're, we're right in. So I will say I was still at FERC uh, when Winter Storm Uri occurred. And, you know, we really did a deep dive into what were the triggers. Um, one of the things, one of the unique attributes about Texas that for a number of years, people envied about uh, the the market design in ERCOT was that it's an energy only market. There's no capacity market. In the aftermath of URI, there have been some experts uh, who have felt that if Texas had a capacity market, then perhaps some of the, the, the worst impacts of the rolling blackouts and brownouts that occurred would have had, if Texas had that, those capacity payments for that sort of in case, break in case of emergency to simplify it. Similarly, look, Texas is not interconnected to other parts of the grid because Texas wants to maintain their independence. And I learned yeah. this 
firsthand, uh, working very closely with former Energy Secretary Rick Perry. One of the first things Secretary Perry told me when I took my seat at FERC was, don't mess with Texas. There has been some analysis that showed that if Texas had been interconnected to other regions, then perhaps those regions could have transferred surplus capacity and perhaps avoided some of the worst Im impacts of that uh, uh, of, the, of the aftermath of URI. Bottom line, these are all really, really complicated questions. I think too often folks try and simplify them to say, well, Texas, is it good to be independent or is it good to be interconnected? There's pros and cons to both, and they're really, really complicated. And the truth is, it's a lot of gray, but gray is tough to cover in print or on a podcast or in a news <laughs> clip, not on that all that complicated gray, uh, which is really where a lot of this policy plays out. Yeah. Well, you know, I like the independence. Obviously, that's one of the reasons why I live here in Texas. So as of right now, I'm glad we are independent the way the country seems to be going. I mean, but, you know, in the end, I mean, Texas has a lot of new residents. Obviously, there's a push for green energy now, which, you know, as, as you know, I mean, obviously, the government is trying to force people into it as opposed to you know, giving them an option. So electricity is coming a lot more important, right? I mean, because, you know, if you're going to have all these electric cars running around the country, I mean, is there, I mean, you know, how, do, how does the, I mean, how, when you look at the electric grid, I mean, how are they going to, if if they are able to do this, I mean, how are they going to accomplish it with, with the way the grid is today? Look, electricity has always been important. Um, the reality is electricity is the one thing that touches every single American. Right. Uh, but we are so fortunate in this country that we take electricity for granted. I felt that my foremost responsibility when I was at FERC and that of my colleagues was our responsibility for the reliability of the grid to make sure that when Americans hit the switch, the lights come on. And that's a really, really complicated process with a lot of variables and I think most Americans don't even think about it. They just hit the switch and they hope the lights come on. And when they don't, it's a real problem. Yeah. Our grid is a period of transition right now. Um, what we are seeing is uh, the business case for clean energy, renewable energy is improving. Texas is at the epicenter of it. It is a huge renewable power state. Um, as the costs of renewables coupled with natural gas come down, um, there are real exciting opportunities to transition the grid, but we're doing so at a time when we're trying to electrify more and more things. You're talking about electrifying the automotive fleet and moving to electric vehicles. People are talking about electrifying buildings. Um, there's, you know, uh, significant uh, new energy consumers coming into the fray. You think about cryptocurrency and Bitcoin mining data centers, which are big, huge consumers of energy. And let's see what AI drives in terms of energy consumption. So you've got a situation where the grid is transitioning. We're retiring sources of generation that we have relied upon for that reliability, for that consistent power. We're replacing those resources at a time when we are putting more and more demand on the grid for electricity, while simultaneously contending with extreme weather events, it's a really, really, really complicated and co and difficult conundrum that policymakers, regulators, consumers all have to think through very carefully. It's a lot of the policymakers, you know, obviously they're, they're trying to, you know, move a lot faster than the grid is able to, to I mean, you know, to be upgraded. And, you know, in the last week, I guess, or actually a couple of days ago, you know, you're starting to hear a lot of pushback from these bigger companies that, you know, had contracted to do these offshore wind projects. And now they're saying that, you know, they're not economical. Uh, you look at uh, as far as that. So a lot of these companies are starting to push back and saying that, you know, we can't make any money doing these these huge projects. And uh, so. Yeah, I know one of the things that you talk about a lot that I'm very interested in is the fuel cell technology. So can you touch a little bit on that, on how that differs from solar and wind? Yeah, I'll get to fuel cells in a second. But what you raise is a really, really critical point that I've been harping on. And that is that, you know, increasingly energy has become too interesting 
And suddenly you've got everyone from politicians uh, to CEOs who are taking an active role in energy policy decisions that used to be made by engineers and lawyers. <laughs> happening now is plants are being retired for political reasons, not engineering reasons. You've got governors and local officials who are taking fossil fuel plants offline when they're still necessary to maintain reliability. And they're doing so before the balancing resources, before the replacements, the, the cleaner energy sources that they want to rely upon before they're ready to go. And the end result of that is curtailments or blackouts or brownouts and threats to reliability. And so that's the problem. And so people ask me, Neil, that's the problem. What is the solution? To me, it's very simple. And I'm not saying this to be funny. We need to make energy policy boring again. When energy policy is boring and you let the nerds sort it out, you get constructive outcomes without all of the drama. What's been happening now is it's be, energy's too interesting and you've got politicians weighing in where they don't have the expertise. I wanna take the politicians out of the process and re-empower the engineers. Um, and that plays on fuel cells as well. Sorry to be rambling on so much, but I'm a former Senate staffer. It's in our blood. That's what we do. We talk. Um, you know, no, I, fuel think cell that, I, which, I think that's very interesting, you know, because like you were saying, a lot of the politicians, I mean, they don't really look into the aspects of what's going to replace, you know, the and, and in fact, you know, if you listen to the EIA or Energy Information Administration, I mean, they feel that oil and gas is going to still be the number one produce, I mean, the number one fuel used to generate electricity, you know, for the next 15 to 20 years. But it seems to me like a lot of these politicians, you know, just to get votes or maybe that's it's something, you know, it's the new green word out there to say, yeah, let's take all this offline. I mean, you know, and let's get rid of your gas stoves. Let's get rid of your hot water heaters. I think the most recent thing is, you know, your ceiling fans are burning too much electricity. I mean, you know, so so they just seem to, you know, try to outdo each other, right? I, I actually, I, I think, quite frankly, both sides are being a little bit irresponsible when it comes to this issue of reliability. I think on the political left, you have people who are so focused on just achieving their decarbonization goals by a certain target that they sweep concerns about reliability under the rug. They say, hey, let's just go ahead and you know retire these gas plants because they emit carbon and we'll worry about you know uh, the reliability down the road. We'll be able to innovate our way out of it. Some new technology will come along and save us. And that's irresponsible. You cannot rely upon you know some miracle innovation that doesn't yet exist to replace necessary generation. On the other side, on the political right, and I'm a conservative, uh, I, I can say this, some of my friends are weaponizing real concerns about reliability to slow down or kill the energy tr transition. And I don't like that approach either. I think we need to have a, a rational, reasonable conversation on how do we transition to a cleaner grid while maintaining reliability and affordability as well. Because what's happening now is, you know, when you're relying upon subsidies to sort of drive investment in certain te technologies, the end result is when those subsidies run out, that might make that generation really, really expensive. And that hurts Americans too. So I think I, I wish both political parties would kind of stand down and, and just allow the engineers to sort it out and, and we just get better results. Because when you have the government subsidizing, you know, this type of energy and not, as you say, you know, have the, the companies out there actually generating, like, you know, you got the government now, they went out and they pushed all this electric car, you know, I mean, everybody needs to drive an electric car, but it seems like they kind of put the cart before the horse, right? I mean, you should have the charging stations first before you have the electric cars that people can't seem to plug their cars in if they want to go on a trip. Is that not correct? Yeah. What, what the administration did was they pushed policies to promote the sale of electric vehicles, but not necessarily the use of electric vehicles. Um, you know, in Kentucky, where I'm from, where people have to drive long durations, Folks aren't going to buy an electric vehicle unless they have confidence that they can go a significant range of distance and charge up. And we don't have the charging infrastructure in place in this country. 
for people to get comfortable with that range anxiety. And so I, I completely agree with you. We needed the infrastructure in place first. Then we needed to do incentivize the purchase of the vehicles. And, uh, and they did it in kind of reverse order, again, because they were trying to achieve a political objective, uh, not an engineering one. In essence, it, it causes everything to go up in price because, you know, if you're trying to push this agenda, you know, you're you're basically using more electricity, but also like Kentucky, like Texas. I mean, you have a lot of rural areas that, you know, have to farm for a living or ranch for a living. I mean, they're not going to be able to, to buy an electric vehicle or they're not going to be able to buy an electric tractor. I mean, you know, you still need diesel fuel and you need fossil fuels in order to to basically keep the cost of living down, right? Yeah, there's no question about it. And and there's different challenges in different regions of the country. And yeah, maybe electric vehicles will work in big urban metropolises, but they're likely to be less successful in rural areas until you get the infrastructure in place. And I just think we're a ways off from, uh, from getting there. Now, things like fuel cells, which you asked about, yeah. can be part of the solution. Uh, but even there, you know, uh, you have policymakers that get in the way. Yeah, so let's talk about fuel cells because I'm I'm very interested in that topic, and I know you you know quite a bit about it. So can you tell us a little bit about what a fuel cell is? <laughs> yeah, so fuel cells are a unique form of power generation that use an electrochemical reaction to produce electricity rather than the combustion or burning that other forms of traditional power generation uses. So few cells can use things like natural gas or biogas that are just fundamentally different uh, than other uses of gases. And so it's not really the fuel, but it's the, the sort of the, 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 the carrier uh, of hydrogen. And so a fuel cell takes in that natural gas splits the hydrogen out of it, and then uses that hydrogen as fuel. Mm. And uh, it, it's clean, it's, its emissions are near zero. Um, and and, and there's, these are really exciting technologies uh, that can generate and deliver electricity through virtually any conditions and you know are often used by customers that wanna be sustainable, but absolutely need the power to remain on interrupted. Uh, so here I'm talking about things like data centers, hospitals, telecom, advanced manufacturing, all we've been talking about, reliability, affordability, clean power, you know, fuel cells are a, a great tool in that toolkit. So is the technology available now? It is. Um, and, and you know, uh, uh, you, you've got a number of companies that are, are working in this space um, at scale. Uh, who can who can really get you know some of these uh, uh, technologies out there? And I think you know there's exciting opportunities. So how much does a fuel cell cost? Do you know? I you know that's that's a question for the engineers. <laughs> well, I know that I know there's been a lot of talk in the past. I think at one point in time we were talking about fuel cells for cars, right? And uh, and you know of course it's changed now to electric, but do you still have to have the same type of uh, rare earth minerals to build a fuel cell or is it a lot easier to a lot simpler technology yeah i think it's simpler technology and i think you know because these companies have been around for a while i think they've figured out um you know how to levelize costs and, and bring those costs down um but again uh, i defer to the accountants and the engineers on on what the what the core costs are so what is the biden biden administration what's their position on fuel cells you know it, it, it's kind of interesting uh the biden administration a lot of you know democratic governors um who are dealing with this they're in a weird spot on the one hand they like fuel cells because fuel cells provide you know more distributed forms of energy they have near zero emissions and they're intrigued by that possibility on the other hand, because the underlying feedstock in many cases is natural gas, and you're seeing increased hostility from Democrats towards natural gas, that puts some of these folks in a bind. And as with many things with the Biden administration, sadly, they often find themselves talking out both sides of their mouth. Yeah. On, the one, <laughs> on the other hand, you've got you know places, you, you look at a state like California, which has got some really innovative companies that are banning natural gas and banning natural gas hookups in certain parts of the state. Um, 
fuel cells could play a huge role in, in helping California decarbonize while maintaining reliability and affordability. But when you've got jurisdictions that are banning natural gas, uh, it, it complicates things. So, um, you know, I think this is just one of those areas where, you know, trying to balance environmental political goals with engineering and reliability goals just comes into conflict. So do fuel cells, do they operate independently of uh, the grid or they have to work with, I mean, do they sell electricity to the grid? How does that work? Fuel cells are very flexible and they can be deployed either behind a customer meter or as part of the utility distribution function itself. And so I, I don't want to get too deep into the right, weeds here. Right. Uh, but basically, uh, a fuel cell can be deployed in what's called a grid parallel mode, which means it's interconnected to the grid and will cease operating if the grid goes down. They're more commonly deployed in a microgrid format, which will kind of isolate itself for the grid and continue operating if the grid does go down. Um, I see. The simple way to explain everything that I've just laid out is they're very flexible. Yeah, no, that's a very interesting technology. And have, have, I mean, has the military been using that technology in the past or is it basically uh, comp larger companies? You know, I, I think it varies. Um, I think, you know, uh, I know enough about some of these companies to know that they're, they're working, you know, with the Department of Defense um, and, and, and trying to market these technologies. Again, I'm not close enough to it to tell you at right. what level. And, and, and where in the country and who's utilizing them. But, you know, when it comes to reliability of power, there's no more critical need for reliability when it comes to ensuring uh, the military readiness, readiness uh, of our troops. They got to have power at all times. And so um, I think, you know, the, the Defense Department is very good uh, about ensuring that, uh, that we have reliable power to support our troops. You know, you've been in government for a while, and I kind of want to ask this question, you know, as far as, you know, as, as we talking about a little bit earlier, that, you know, one side is very extreme, the other side, you know, has their own agenda. It seems to me, you know, as as we change administrations, you know, whether we're going from Republicans or we're going from Democrats, that it, it seems the taxpayer is the person that always gets caught in the middle because you've got like, for example, the Biden administration, I mean, they're very extreme, right? And, you know, they want to do away with fossil fuels. And then, of course, if Trump gets reelected or if we get a conservative back in the in the White House, you know, then we're going to go the opposite direction. Right. So everything's going to shift back. And, you know, hopefully you get some people in the middle that you know, some moderates that they kind of, you know, basically look at the overall big picture instead of one extreme to the left. Do you think that'll ever happen again in Washington or are people <laughs> just so divided? <laughs> one of the reasons I, I really sought out the opportunity to serve on the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission and, and including as chair is I really feel that FERC is a beacon of stability in an otherwise volatile landscape. What do I mean by that? You said it perfectly. You look at EPA. EPA went one direction under the Obama administration, went a completely different direction under the Trump administration, and has now whipsawed even harder in the other direction under the Biden administration and could whipsaw again if, uh, if uh, President Trump is back in the White House or another Republican gets in there. When you're talking about energy investments in communities, these are not one or two year investments. These are oftentimes 10, 20, 30 year investment decisions, and it is maddening to try and peg those decisions to the political pendulum wildly swinging back and forth. What makes FERC unique is one, it's an independent agency. So when I was chair, I wasn't like a cabinet official that reported to the president. I was independent. It's also got a bipartisan configuration. So FERC has five members, no more than three can serve from one political party. So you're always gonna have people from the other political party on the commission. So when I was chair, there were Democrats on the commission who held me accountable. And if they thought I was going too far in one direction, they could write dissenting opinions and make legal arguments to try and slow down what I was trying to do. Similarly, today, under the Biden administration, there's a Democratic chair of the commission, but there are Republicans there 
who are holding that Democratic chairman accountable. So FERC really is sort of that that stability. Did FERC go in a different direction under my leadership than my predecessors in the Obama administration? Absolutely. But it wasn't a dramatically different direction. Absolutely. Similarly, FERC's gone in a different direction under the Biden administration than it did when I was leading it, but it's not a dramatically different direction. And that's really, really important because when it comes to something as important and critical as electricity, you just don't want politics to, to kind of interfere with it. And that's why FERC is sort of this, this, this bastion in an otherwise really politicized landscape. Yeah, no, I agree with you a hundred percent. I mean, I think a lot more of our agencies need to, to, kind of be pushed away from just being a political arm of the current administration, because in the end, I mean, it seems like we take two steps forward and then three steps backwards every time, you know, something changes because obviously they've got different point of views. And, you know, if you're saying, you know, that you have people on both sides, that that's a lot better. I would much prefer EPA to be structured like FERC, bipartisan configuration. You know, when Democrats have the White House, the EPA administrator could be a Democrat, but there need to be Republicans who have equal voting power to make sure EPA doesn't just whipsaw like crazy all over the place. I'd love to see EPA structured like FERC because otherwise you have what you have right now, which is just wild swings, which is not good for anybody. No. In fact, you know, I mean, we wonder how we end up spending so much money is because we keep going different directions every every four to five four to eight years depending on which wind the wind which way the wind blows That's right well neil it was great having you on the show today and uh, i'd love to have you back in the future and talk a little bit more about this like i said that's a technology that really interests me being in the energy business i mean you know fuel cell technology i've heard the heard about it but i've you know never really you know understood it a lot like you put it so thank you very much really appreciate you having me on i enjoyed it okay great thank you you've been listening to the energy show with rei energy energize your investments and maximize your tax deductions to learn more go to reienergy.com